uh, Tim and Eric, I'm uh, part of VeloCloud, uh, and as uh, he was mentioning, uh, VeloCloud is a fabric uh, portfolio company, so we are gracious enough to sponsor an event here today as well, and many thanks for that. Uh, and they were offering a uh, speaker slot to us, so that's uh, fantastic. So uh, what I'd like to do today is walk you through some of the thought process that actually uh, led up uh, to the formation of the company and the development of the service. And uh, we're set out to do and make uh, some uh, changes in the status quo of uh, traditional enterprise branch networking. So uh, first I want to walk you to a little bit of uh, the way uh, currently uh, one networking is done today. And if we go way back in time, uh, then we saw that the branch offices were actually interconnected by uh, traditional lease lines. Over time, we saw the addition of internet links uh, feeding into those branch offices. Uh, and now we're at a point where uh, uh, branch offices are connected to MBLS circuits on the one hand side to connect to their private data centers, uh, and then uh, backed up by uh, traditional internet links uh, in which they have an IPsec tunnel and lots of feedback uh, into the data centers. Uh, and given the expensive nature of MPLS, uh, there has been uh, quite a bit of effort in the one optimization space so that we can squeeze every last bit uh, of information out of that expensive <laughs> MPLS circuit. So this is sort of like the uh, mechanism of how you would safely deploy uh, a corporate or enterprise one network today. So very traditional. Uh, another uh, important aspect is that we see that a lot of the services are actually gravitating towards the data center at this point. So there is a small number of services that are being deployed at the branches. Uh, and there is just an emerging set of services that are being going into the uh, SaaS providers. So uh, a couple of market uh, trends that we see at the same time. So these are actually not new trends, but they come along with a couple of new spins every other year or so. Uh, so we still find that a lot of organizations are spreading across the globe. Uh, smaller branch offices are being established. Uh, and typical uh, result of that is that there is no IT staff on site. So it's very difficult to maintain and manage equipment in those small uh, office locations. Uh, and that uh, drives a need to actually have some sort of like centralized management uh, that gives you visibility and control over that equipment that is out there. So at the same time, big push in the last couple of years to move applications into the cloud. So cloud vendors have been very successful in convincing enterprise customers that uh, the cloud is ready for prime time and that you can actually move some of uh, your business critical applications into the cloud. Now, uh, the complication with that previous picture that I was just showing is that MPLS doesn't get you there unless you back all that through the data center. So there is this de-emphasis on uh, MPLS circuits and there's an increased emphasis on uh, making sure that you have reliable last mile connectivity to the internet available at each of those branches. Uh, and then we have the classic uh, cost and risk uh, uh, reduction pressure. So there is a diminishing IT budget on hand. Uh, so we need to make sure that we can do much more with uh, uh, an ever decreasing set of uh, budget. Uh, at the same time, there is a, a good inclination of uh, moving to pure OPEX services so that there is very minimal risk involved in like, rolling out and trialing new services and that you don't have to worry about like large capital expenditure to, to make that happen. Uh, and most of the drivers uh, to make changes are financial uh, of nature, so uh, nothing is really different on, on this perspective as well. Uh, so what I've done over here is like give you a quick overview of like what a broadband circuit costs on a per meg basis and how much an MPLS circuit costs on a per meg basis. Uh, and I should point out that uh, the broadband side is a very conservative uh, estimate uh, and the MPLS side is a very aggressive uh, estimate. So this is sort of like the worst uh, case financial uh, optimizer. Uh, and we see that uh, on broadband we're looking at about $4 <coughs> per meg uh, that you can currently uh, get circuits in, uh, in a branch. On the MPLS side, we're looking at about $50 to $60 per meg, and that's, again, very conservative estimate. So at a minimum, we're looking at about a 15x spread in between the cost of uh, broadband circuits and MPLS circuits. Uh, and of course, uh, everything is driven towards these cost reductions, so um, MPLS is actually one of the larger budget items, or private circuits in general is one of the larger budget items on uh, the expenses. Yeah. So, if we take a blank slate and we want to see like how would you uh, have an enterprise uh, branch network look like, then what would be the characteristics that we want to pursue? So the first thing that we want to get away from is uh, this notion of like having functional networks. So, right? Yeah. Please, why is the MPLS? Uh, why do you think it takes six weeks of lead times? Is it? Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of service providers, etc. They are trying to work towards uh, to reduce those lead times as well. Uh, yes, absolutely, and, and that is uh, absolutely the case for the U.S., but if you go abroad, then these lead times uh, typically jump exponentially. So, and uh, we're looking at deploying on an international basis, so 
uh, if you have an organization that needs to deploy both in Asia, Pac, Europe, and the US, then in the US, yes, you can absolutely get this under six weeks lead times. And uh, there is an, uh, never uh, pressure from the service providers to actually make that in a shorter time frame. But if you go into Asia, Pac, and even in Europe to a certain extent, then those are deadlines that are uh, difficult to meet. So uh, again, uh, uh, what do we want to get out of uh, a new network if we would have to think this from scratch? So first of all, is we want to get rid of this uh, uh, functional network, and that is the MPLS network that uh, I was uh, showing before, where uh, the MPLS network will just get you to the data center, but not really anywhere else. So we want to make sure that we can consolidate uh, all the capacities uh, uh, and uh, bring them together in a single functional block. Uh, and that we can do this in an active-active fashion as well, so that we don't have capacities that are sitting idle uh, while other ones are being overextended. And we want to make sure that we can actually add and drop these capacities on a real-time basis without any service interruption. So that means if we're running out of capacity in a single branch, we could just go to a Verizon store, get ourselves an LTE stick, plug that in, and that capacity just magically gets added. So that's uh, one of the advantages. Uh, another uh, uh, component is, like I mentioned, uh, there is this uh, more increasing availability of broadband links uh, as well as wireless broadband links. Uh, and they're becoming increasingly uh, less uh, expensive at this point. So we're looking at $4 per meg. This actually is going down uh, by the minute at this point. Uh, and uh, from an IT perspective, we also want to make sure that we can uh, support very rapid deployments. So that you can, uh, at the same day, make a decision to drop ship a unit out to a field uh, and get that activated in the same day. So that's another key uh, metric. Uh, and then the last but not the least item is that we also want to have some flexibility in where we enable services in those uh, kind of environments. So we actually want to centralize some of the services in uh, areas where we can better control these and uh, extract some of the complexity of uh, areas on the branch where we don't have a lot of uh, compute power. So how, why can't we actually do this today? If we look from a service angle, then to be honest, we can actually do this. It just is very cumbersome. We can actually look and ship a hypervisor uh, into a branch. We need to uh, procure some uh, support uh, uh, contract now that actually uh, will be able to connect to that hypervisor. And then we need to manually establish a service chaining rule as well as a redirection uh, uh, mechanism on the router to actually move that traffic into that hypervisor. So all in all, very difficult, especially if we have to do this on an international basis, and especially if we want to do this on a uh, very rapid basis as well. So if we look at it from the networking angle, then what are the obstacles over there? Uh, so if we want to uh, take uh, very inexpensive broadband links and we want to add that into uh, a, a CPE device over there, uh, then you would all know that uh, uh, any broadband link has quite a bit of packet loss, latency variations. Uh, and in the case of cable, uh, we see dramatic decreases of the bandwidth over time as well. Uh, especially if you come home at 3 o'clock, all the kids come home, Netflix goes online in all the households around the office, and you see the uh, performance uh, drop dramatically. So and this all re uh, uh, yields to voice calls being dropped, video artifacting is happening, VDI sessions are stopped. So if we want to expand a little bit on that, so the, the next step is like, so how can we actually utilize these links in an active-active fashion? Uh, so we could use uh, equal cost multipath routing, that's uh, of course a well-tested uh, technique uh, to do today. Uh, but these links that we just plugged in, uh, they may be equal from a financial cost perspective, but they're definitely uh, equal from a performance angle. So that makes it very difficult to uh, align those links up in the ECP. PBR is another mechanism where we do policy-based routing and we take certain application sets, move that to one specific set of link and let all the other traffic go into uh, the remaining link. Uh, again, that's an option, but it's very difficult to manage that, especially in a high availability environment where you want to do failover of these applications as well. Uh, dynamic routing protocols has been historically focused on uh, dealing with advertising uh, subnet availability, but they've never been uh, good at uh, uh, working uh, on changing networking conditions. So they have no visibility at all into packet loss scenarios or latency variations in the network. So um, we have this concept called uh, virtual CPE, and uh, this is uh, sort of like an emerging concept that's been uh, around for um, at least a year, I would say, at this point. And uh, a virtual CPE is essentially trying to combine and incorporate some of the SDN and NFE principles and extend and project that into the branch network inside of the house. So for SDN, the classic routine is there, we want to, control, we want to separate the control and the data plane. 
uh, and that uh, allows us to uh, implement very rapidly new techniques for packet and flow handling. So uh, NFE is actually a mechanism that uh, will uh, allow us to uh, move some of the critical networking functions, uh, virtualize those, and move them around in uh, areas where we have uh, much more compute available as well. So how do we do this? Um, very straightforward. If we look at the SDN application, uh, then the first thing that we want to do again is like separate the control and the data plane. And you see that on the right-hand side, we extract uh, the control plane, so this is a centralized control plane that has full visibility into all the appliances that are on the network as well as uh, insight into the link uh, conditions as well. I know we have a distributed uh, data plane uh, that is uh, sprinkled around in the internet as an overlay mechanism. Uh, and this overlay mechanism uh, allows us to uh, immediately deploy in a redundant fashion so that the CPE device can actually talk to multiple of these gateways in parallel. If one of them fails, that really becomes uh, in, uh, consequential to the operation of the network. So what do we do with extending NFV into the branch? Um, in that particular case, we want to make sure that we can uh, both activate new services in the branch that were uh, uh, usually not available because of monolithic uh, uh, CPE devices. Uh, and we also want to make sure that we can extract some of the more complex functions uh, and uh, introduce those in the data center or in the ISP edge. Uh, and of course, the goal of all of this is that the orchestrator, which is that uh, central brain uh, of the control plane, uh, that it can orchestrate the entire service chain, uh, whether uh, services are living inside the branch in a combination of in the branch and in the data center. So um, this is exactly what Philocloud has actually set out to do. So we uh, recently uh, launched a service that is actually uh, following all these principles and that have uh, uh, two uh, major categories uh, that is tracking. So the idea is that we can actually take appliances and drop ship those into an environment uh, and that there's almost a zero touch uh, activation to get those sites online. So uh, activating a branch in this particular case is as simple as clicking on a link in an email and then this, uh, the site will get associated to the right customer ID, the right set of profiles and those profiles and policies will now trickle through to the device in an automated fashion. Uh, if there are uh, any virtual uh, services uh, deployed in that uh, profile as well, uh, then we immediately activate those on the network. So that makes it uh, easy to uh, deploy sites uh, in a very rapid fashion. Yes? So, you are doing away with network, okay? uh, We don't fully do away with it, but we give you the option to uh, navigate away from MBLS. So everything is cost-driven uh, in this particular case, right? So we're focused on like smaller branches. Uh, where typically MPLS is even not into play because of its, uh, that is cost prohibitive. So, but if there is existing MPLS there, then we actually are able to tie in the MPLS to the existing device. You kind of mentioned that uh, the application's latency and, you know, you kind of move around or something like that. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll get to that though a little bit, but yes, there is a mechanism in which we bond, uh, bond together uh, the, the links and we do live measurements on uh, what is going on with the link conditions. And then as a result, we can make steering decisions on the application. Yes, from a protocol perspective, absolutely, but uh, from a link perspective, so if you subscribe to an MPLS circuit, there is no LDP flowing out to those sites, but you subscribe to an MPLS service, essentially. Did you terminate MPLS as well? Yes, so that is uh, an option uh, that's actually available in one of our next releases that we do in native MPLS. So, so can I say for this device, what you have to are directly connected to the internet at the moment for this service? I'm sorry, can you repeat so the question? For this device, uh, or because we don't support MPLS, does it mean that we will have to connect to the internet so that we can get the weekend connection? All right, so I can walk you through a couple of scenarios. So if you have an existing MPLS router, there's an easy way to actually integrate uh, the service into that one. Uh, but as I mentioned in uh, our next release, we're actually natively to the circuits in the device itself. So, yeah. Yes? So it's, it's, a, it's a VM, uh, how you call it, what, what do you call it like? Ah, <laughs> I'll open my magic bag of tricks. <laughs> So this is uh, what it looks like, and I'll have a slide a little bit further down. So um, I mentioned this concept of a virtual CPE. So a virtual CPE is actually not virtual, it's a physical device. Uh, the intention of uh, a virtual CPE is that some of the network functions are deployed as a virtualized uh, container on these uh, devices. 
So it's not only doing link bonding at this particular point, but it's a full hypervisor as well. <laughs> we are not yet using OVS, but uh, we've been actually getting quite a few requests on that front. Because once you're using OVS, then you don't need that, right? You can, I, mean, I can just have a server in my remote side and just, uh, just control uh, my, uh, my server through OVS. Yes, that is absolutely the case, but that's uh, a little bit of a problem if you ship into sites where there's no IT set on it. So, uh, where's no IT set on it? So we, we, uh, we are actually <coughs> intending to dropship these devices so that you can actually zero touch and do it. So we want to make sure that we can ship this into a five uh, uh, person uh, site uh, where uh, nobody really understands anything about network. That's where we go. So different ones. Yes, go ahead. So if you're not using MTOS, what kind of limitations do you have? Because you have to have a network that's not going to be Yes, so let me move forward a little bit. Uh, So let me switch back to this one. So yes, uh, the uh, intention is that we uh, plug in multiple broadband connections. Uh, and you can see that there are like USB ports on the, on the side, so we can uh, just terminate USB modems uh, for 4G uh, connectivity as well. Uh, and uh, it's indeed the intention that like you uh, apply multiple technologies, plug it into the system and we can characterize these links in real time. Uh, and then we can make decisions whether is the bet, uh, which one is the better link. So from an application perspective, we're looking at one holistic link uh, that just happened to be commissioned. Any other questions? Yeah, so if you go back to your slide, I saw in, your, in the SaaS application, there's a company called Websense. Yep. So can you comment on the security features? Yes, absolutely. So the, the platform is an enabler to uh, uh, move uh, into some of these cloud applications, right? So uh, we, we don't want to deploy like a virtual appliance for Websense on the site that becomes way too complicated. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, WebSense has a SaaS service available. So the uh, intention is that we actually uh, redirect the traffic to the WebSense uh, uh, domain and let that traffic scrubbing happen uh, over there. One question. Yes? Is the controller in the cloud or? Uh, Everything is in the cloud except for this little puppy here. Uh, yes, so the controller is in the so cloud. As a managed service? Yes. Okay. So it's a managed service both from a control plane aspect as well as from a data plane. And the data plane is completely distributed in the cloud as well. Yes. You mentioned that it's also the Yes, that's correct. So, so the, what sort of, what sort of services can be enabled on the is decided by the central controller, or is it something that the customer can install whatever services that he wants on the on the microwave? Yeah, so we're going to launch that portion of the service with a limited set of uh, functionalities, but it's uh, uh, definitely the intention to over time just open it up to any virtual appliance that uh, has enough uh, uh, course available on that system. That is actually uh, done through this orchestrator. We switch back, so there's an orchestrator on the right side, so the orchestrator will uh, both deliver the images towards the uh, appliance and also do the service chain with other services uh, that are enabled. Correct, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Sorry, go ahead. It seems like you have, you're calling it an orchestrator, but it actually is a controller because you are not only really using the virtual <coughs> as a virtual appliance, and it could be multiple set of virtual appliances, but you're also using it for uh, managing the processing that is happening over there. Yeah, so the so orchestrator is... switch it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a hypervisor, it has virtual appliances, there are a bunch of things that are being controlled by your orchestrator. That is absolutely correct. So the uh, uh, or the orchestrator essentially gives you command and control over the entire network, whether that is looking at how we see our applications and providing that intelligence, or whether it's uh, actually service chain multiple uh, virtualized network. Yeah. No, uh, packets will never go to the control. So the control is just uh, uh, control plane traffic, of course, right? So. Uh, if you look at uh, these uh, uh, elements in the network, so that's really where all the, the data is flowing through. You've answered a lot of dumb questions. Just one last question. Does hypervisor increase or decrease your security? Um, I guess that would depend on what you deploy on the hypervisor. Uh, but uh, the, the system is set up in such a way that only the uh, orchestrator has control access of the system. So 
uh, we essentially shut down pretty much any port on the network at this point. Right. How many CPU cores are Right, so this uh, particular device only has a uh, two core system, but this is one of our uh, early uh, production systems. Uh, but we're actually deploying uh, a system that has eight cores as well. And what about memory? Uh, memory, we're in the 16 gig range, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Uh, disk space is actually an interesting uh, question uh, because we have a USB port, so we can actually extend uh, external disk space. Uh, but it's a modular system in the sense that we can add uh, disks uh, internally as well. But they're not, in this part of your model, they're not available. Yes? Uh, yeah, so um, the bundling protocol itself is actually a tunneling mechanism, but we also allow traffic to flow directly up to the internet. Mm -hmm. So bundling is, uh, you can bundle different types of, different link types, let's say, let's say one MPLS link and one uh, DSL link, so you can have bundling, or is it... Uh, correct. That's, that's absolutely correct, yes. So as long as these links can reach a, a common gateway, then uh, uh, independent of like the, uh, the, the, uh, the access mechanism that you're plugging into the system, so the network will actually uh, characterize the, the performance characteristics uh, and then make decisions accordingly. Which, in that case, the tunnel is terminated by another appliance of the developer? Uh, it is terminated in this uh, cloud in the middle. So that is actually run as a service. Any question? Which protocol do you use to, from the control plane to program the forwarding on the on the CPT in the branch? Uh, we use a REST API that is secured. This has this uh, quality of service and some other things. So do you also, uh, since you are using a NPLS so... Uh, <coughs> uh, yes, so we do support uh, QoS, but we do that a little bit differently than uh, the traditional NPLS routine. Uh, traditionally, like if you look at uh, enabling QoS, and you say, like, I've got 10 megs available, and I'm going to slice off so many megs for this particular uh, application. Uh, in this case, uh, since you're dealing with ESL and cable links, you don't know at any point in time how much capacity you have. So we do measure that and we set uh, policies uh, uh, relative to that uh, available capacity. So it does mean that uh, non-business critical traffic is actively being deprioritized rather than prioritizing business critical traffic. Yes, go ahead. So since you talk about are you doing managing, are you providing the cloud services? Yes, so we operate this as a cloud service, so that means uh, both control plane is operated uh, as a cloud service as well. Right. So, in short, this data plane, is that your uh, cloud plane? Yep, that's correct. And it's uh, done as an overlay uh, just over the internet. So, you purchase capacity from uh, those providers and put your nodes? Yes, so we, we do operate our own data centers to terminate that traffic, yes. So, so the immediate hop from the CP is to, to the, your data center or opposed to multiple other hubs? Um, the immediate hope from uh, an application perspective is indeed the data center, but uh, if you look at just the transport and of course, like, all the hops in the service provider network will be in there. So, I don't know how many countries are available for this uh, virtual CPU at the moment. Is it just USA only? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, uh, countries. Uh, yeah, so we are focused on the US at this point, but we're actually uh, making it also on the international market. So, we're focusing on Asia, Pac Next, uh, and Europe uh, at the same time. Just uh, I, as an idea that would be an amazing service in China to avoid the, uh, the, the big firewall of China. You're not the first one asking. <laughs> yes, uh, if you know how to fix that, please go in there. Yes, Yeah, there's a question about the uh, cloud uh, uh, network that you mentioned. Uh, is that something that you can do with the cloud network that you have in uh, yes, yeah, so we uh, we also do white labeling of the service, so that's definitely another option as well. So um, the, the gateways, we operate these gateways at the moment. Uh, we operate uh, the control plane as well, but that doesn't really mean that we can uh, provide that as a uh, complete package. Do they provide the services, or do you also provide the magic? Uh, we provide everything at this point. So. Yes. Correct. So let me see what the next slide is. So if we want to focus, and I think there were a couple of questions along these lines, so, so how do we actually do this uh, link bundling, right? Uh, and that's one of the core tenets uh, of the, the solution is that we, uh, if you want to deploy these uh, virtualized functions into the branch and uh, some of them you want to extract into the data center, then you need to make sure that you have a reliable network that you can depend on. 
Uh, and at the same time, uh, to reiterate, we want to do this with the least expensive links that we can possibly can get a hold of. Uh, so we do two uh, main uh, aspects. So we do a live monitoring of all the links that you plug into the system. So that means if you plug uh, a link into any port in the system, uh, we're going to automatically find out uh, which service provider that is on, how much capacity is available on that service provider, and in real time, how much packet loss latency and jitter is on that network. Uh, so that is done through both active and passive probing. So uh, if you plug in the link initially, we're going to do an active uh, measurement. And along uh, the data that is flowing from the customers, we're also going to do passive measurements. So and that gives us sub-second uh, actionable information that we can actually make decisions on. Uh, that combined with like an application, uh, the packet inspection engine, we're actually classifying all the applications that are going through the system. So we're not classifying anymore on individual flows, but we're going to uh, group together every flow that belongs together. So that means that if you want to look at Netflix traffic that com, uh, is comprised out of 10 flows, that would be uh, showing up as a single application. And all of this combined would give us uh, quite a bit of uh, interesting actions that we can uh, undertake. So the first uh, uh, action is that we just steer applications to the better performing link. So that if we see uh, a packet loss on one specific link and we're dealing with a voice flow that goes over that network, we're simply going to move that voice flow midstream to the better performing link. If that second link now it also gets uh, some amount of packet loss or we see latency spikes, then we can dynamically enable forward error correction on those uh, links so that we mitigate uh, the effects of that packet loss on uh, the system. And uh, another uh, magic item is that we can also bump together capacity. So if we're doing bulk file transfer uh, applications and you have like a DSL link of 10 meg and a cable link of 20 meg, you can now transfer at 30 meg. Uh, and I think you were asking about the QoS, so uh, yes, that is something that we do, of course, as well. That's a part of the, the system uh, in the sense that we uh, find out which applications are business critical and we deprioritize them on uh, business critical ones. Uh, and uh, one last uh, topic that I want to cover here is that we do also gateway selection. So uh, remember we have this set of gateways that are deployed in the cloud at the moment. So um, uh, a CPE device can actually talk to multiple gateways in parallel. Uh, and if you want to go to Salesforce and we want to connect to Gateway A for steering that traffic, if you want to go to your own data center and uh, establish a VPN connection there, uh, then we may uh, pick it up another gateway that is more optimal in positions. Yes, yeah. go ahead. Go back to the previous slide. Oh. There we go. Can you give an example, say, automatic server chain rules per application? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly one of those uh, things that you see on the bottom here, right? So uh, depending on the application, we're going to enable forward error correction. Uh, we're also going to pick specific error correction techniques that better suit it for the individual application. Yes. Yeah, so we could do packet replication, we could uh, do dejittering buffering. Uh, at the same time, we can do uh, a certain uh, set of uh, forward error correction. So these are services specific to the network condition. Make sense? Correct. Yes. Right, so um, it, it's combining back those uh, two uh, principles on the top, right? So we do this live measurement, uh, and then uh, we have a proprietary protocol that runs between the uh, uh, CPE device and uh, the gateways that are distributed. So we actually merge these flows back together in the cloud. All of the above, yes. Yeah. So the, the flows will actually be reconditioned when they hit the gate. How do you guys configure the gateway? You don't. It magically works. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, run as a service. So there is uh, gateways are actually completely stateless, so they can take in traffic uh, from multiple sources. There is no actual configuration that resides on the gateway. Yes, and that is actually done by the control plane. So the control plane, the controller will have full visibility of like uh, how many nodes are on the, the data plane side and will provide that information uh, towards the CPUs. Uh, the distribution of data is like the Yes, so at the moment we are uh, operating in several data centers as well as cloud data centers. So uh, there is a gateway selection algorithm in place as well that just finds the best gateway for a specific application. So where do you implement the VNF? Is it inside the box or in your cloud data center with all these services? 
Right, so the, the, the system itself allows you to uh, deploy uh, virtualized functions. Multiple? Yes, multiple on the box or inside your data center. And then you can serve the chaining. So the chaining is from the box all the way to data center? Correct. So the chaining together? Correct. What kind of channel do you use from the data uh, We use a proprietary mechanism at the moment. So this is, uh, we've scoured the market to see if there was anything out there that could fit the needs. There wasn't. So can, can we hold questions for just a minute? Yes. So, if you've got some more slides, <coughs> why don't Almost you? There, so bear yeah, well, let's, let's hold a few questions till the end so we so can continue. Let me show you for a moment on uh, how this actually looks like, right? So, as I mentioned, when you plug in a link, we're going to find out and uh, dynamically characterize what these links are doing. So, we're going to find out uh, which service provider and service is actually available on that particular link, where they're plugged in how much capacity is available, and how much throughput is going to that particular link. <laughs> and then we'll do latency jitter as well as packet loss measurements in real time. And with that information, we're actually going to score the links now uh, to see how they behave for transporting voice traffic. So if we look at the voice traffic, we see most of the time our wireless link uh, is uh, not really up to spec, and that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, we see that there's usually a lot of jitter uh, and latency uh, variations on these wireless links. Uh, but we can make a lot of steering decisions to find, like in this entire green block, we can of course like steer the voice traffic uh, to this particular green block if we see uh, areas where uh, both of them are yellow and impaired for carrying voice traffic. Then we uh, start enabling these dynamic uh, forward error correction techniques. And uh, just to give you an idea uh, to compare with just transactional, and this would be your home experience. So most of these links work just fine for transactional traffic. It's only when you start deploying uh, enterprise grade application that they are actually start breaking down and that's really what we're trying to fix as well. And of course you can also zoom into these uh, areas so that you have an idea of like what is actually happening at that particular time and what did we actually do to fix that uh, particular problem. Uh, from an app detection perspective, uh, so we can characterize about 3,000 applications at this point. Uh, the idea there is that uh, we can look at them both from a pure application perspective as well as from a category perspective. Uh, and we can do a breakdown like all the media applications that are currently on the network. And if we want to find out who is actually sending Spotify traffic on there, we can just click on that and you get a full breakdown of where is that traffic going into the internet and who is actually producing the traffic. Uh, so, quick overview. This is the hardware device. I think we just uh, covered that already. Uh, and this is a, a quick recap slide. So what Vilopa essentially set out to do is combine a couple of uh, things. Uh, and uh, it's almost everything that uh, is uh, on the charter of the, the meetup uh, here today. So we use uh, SDN principles to actually uh, do cloud networking and making sure uh, that we have uh, a distributed control plane as well as a data plane available. Uh, we, use, uh, uh, we can deploy virtualized services to NFV extension into those branches. And then we have this underlying mechanism where we can uh, provide reliable uh, enterprise-grade internet access uh, through virtualizing multiple broadband links. Okay, let's open the floor again for questions. Then. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, you can go back to one slide. Then we have one more in back. Yes, go ahead. Can we go back to one slide because I want to see what other interface? Is it a one-day interface for the LAN and the WAN? Right, so this is a small uh, looking device, but uh, it's actually a full AP. Um, it has dual radio AP uh, as well. Um, so there is, uh, as I mentioned, disk uh, involved in there. There is a uh, full hypervisor. So we're an Intel based platform. Um, we have two uh, wired kick ports for uh, internet connectivity. We have four USB ports for modems. There's an SFP port for taking in MPLS circuits as well. And then we just have four LAN ports. So all of them are one kick port. And how about the Wi Fi? Is it uh, AC or? Uh, this particular version is an N, but our AC is uh, about to be released as well. And how about the full put in general? Is it like uh, that kind of uh, full 1K or...? Yes, yeah, so we are doing about 200 megs with all services enabled. 200 megs. Are you going to share the slides you've presented? I think I can do that. Uh, and I think Victor will likely upload them to some public location. Excuse me. Um, do you guys support multicast over your OLA? Uh, not at this time yet, and uh, the only reason for that is like most service providers actually don't support it, so uh, it wouldn't go anywhere at this point. 
but, but between the branch offices or MPLS, you could technically do that. You could technically do it, but uh, we haven't seen any demand from customers to actually uh, look at that. So most of uh, the deployments at these smaller sites are looking at specific applications or want to do voice or video conferencing. Uh, but multicast applications are typically not found that frequently. Okay. So do you have persistent connections to all these uh, star topology? Or Yes, so um, so we have this proprietary tunneling mechanism and we can actually move a flow from one service provider link to another service provider link uh, without resetting that flow, so the, the flow will stay persistent. So these are not easily based flows? Uh, yes, so any flow will uh, remain in state. And how long does it take for you to detect a uh, link going down and switching? Uh, it's in the 100 milliseconds. So, uh, you mentioned app detection and, uh, based on app policy. What about user? Uh, is there any user based policy or on the enterprise if you want to control traffic based on user identity? And, uh, uh, yes, policy? that is available. So, we do support dot one x authentication on the wireless side, and we have uh, a part of the data engine is also looking at. Uh, individual users, so uh, if I go back to this particular slide here, mm -hmm. so if we do enable dot one x, you will see instead of host names, you will actually see users. Uh, but it wouldn't uh, detect it based on you know, the enterprise uh, directories you know, if you have. Uh, yes, yeah, so at the moment we uh, do backend integration with a radius server, but that in turn could integrate with another. But but it's only 802.1x based. Correct. Yes, at this point it is. What is your cost model? Uh, so we operate as a full service, so it's just a monthly subscription fee. We actually don't charge for the appliance at all. Right. Is there any plan to do the wholesale for other um, companies? Uh, maybe some uh, small service provider in the may want to do a uh, wholesale service service on uh, this uh, solution? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So we've uh, received quite a bit of interest from service providers that want to operate the service, uh, especially in emerging markets. Does this, uh, I mean, we talked at the beginning, you talked about WAN optimization. It looks like it's still complementary to traditional yes. riverbed uh, WAN options. It, it still... could be. So there, uh, inherently, there's a slightly different philosophical tack in the sense that one optimization says you don't have enough bandwidth, place this appliance there, and your bandwidth will increase. In our case, say uh, we're saying bandwidth is actually very inexpensive. Just go get more bandwidth, and we bundle it for you. But that doesn't really fix the latency problem. So, like for long distance, uh, there would still be some need for TCP optimization. That's correct. Yeah. So, customer currently has MPLS. It's only because they have a specific bandwidth requirement that they want to achieve. So, by moving to the solution, unless they have the bandwidth through the internet, still not going to solve the problem for them. So, I mean, let's say the same 10 megabit bandwidth that he's getting now. How are you going to replace it with the internet unless he gets the same 10 megabit bandwidth through the internet? Uh, right, so uh, the, that comes back to the market trends, right? So we see that like a lot of applications are moving to the cloud, so those are typically local.